Turn with me, please, to the book of to address this issue. Which laws do Gentiles keep? Which laws do Jews keep? Are we to strive now? We are saved. Surely working out your salvation with fear and trembling is striving for it as we know it. Philippians 2.12 Most important, we Gentiles are not Jews, are we? What is the difference? These are very basic questions. (coughs) I would have hoped over the years most people knew the answers to these questions. But I also understand that there are more people leaving churches because they can't find a good church and they're coming to meetings like this one for Bible teaching simply because there's no teaching in their churches and there are more people realizing the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews and these are new issues and so as more people become aware of the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews and the place of Israel in eschatology and as more Jewish believers get saved these issues inevitably become subjects that have to be addressed again, just as they were in the early church. Fortunately, however, they were already addressed in the early church. We have an established body of dogma telling us exactly what we should and should not do and how we should understand these things. The early church had to grapple with these things. The apostles had a council to address these things. We only have to look at what was already decided. Look with me, please, to Galatians. Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 6. I'm amazed that you are quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of the Messiah for a different gospel. (coughs) Which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of the Messiah. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say now again, that any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you receive, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were not still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. He was dealing with an issue where people were trying to put other people under the bondage of Jewish law. Now let's understand something. The first passage, Daniel chapter 9. Verses 24 and 25. The Messiah would come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. The biggest section of Mosaic law was concerned with the Levitical sacrificial system, blood atonement. Since 70 AD, since the prophecy of Daniel and of Jesus, who reiterated it in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, and Mark 13, since Jesus came and died and the temple was destroyed, it is impossible for anybody to keep the law. The most observant Jew in the world, the most intensely dedicated rabbi cannot possibly keep the law of Moses. There is no temple, there is no high priest, unless you become a believer in Yeshua, when he becomes your high priest, and the body of Christ is the temple. We still have a temple, we still have a high priest, we still have a blood atonement, they don't. What you have is a counterfeit Judaism. It's called Talmudic Judaism. What the rabbis have attempted to do is to compensate for the fact that they can't keep so much of the Torah by inventing other things to do instead, called mitzvot. 
in the process, they fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah 2.13. I've explained this before. Can you look at it, please? My people, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, have committed two evils against me. The first evil is they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. They would reject the Messiah. John chapter 7, who's the fountain of living water? Jesus. What's the living water? Holy Spirit. The first evil was they would reject the Messiah, the fountain of living water. The second evil is they would hoop for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They would invent a spiritually bankrupt religion to replace the Torah. Okay? <coughs> Remember, the problem with unsaved Jewish people, the real problem is not that they reject Yeshua, Jesus. That's not the problem. That is the result of the problem. The problem is they reject Moses and the Torah. John chapter 5, Jesus said directly, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. If they really believed the Torah, they'd know they couldn't keep it. They know the Messiah would have had to come already. Jewish rejection of Jesus is the result of the Jewish rejection of the Torah. No matter what they tell you, that's what you have. Judaism is based, in its present form, on a rejection of the Torah. So now you have a situation where believers, even non-Jews, are trying to keep something that Jews can't possibly keep themselves. Rather silly, isn't it? But let's go on. He says, if an angel comes with another gospel, let him be anathema. Anathemizo in Greek. Accursed. If somebody believes salvation comes by sacraments, as the Roman church teaches, they're a curse of God. If you think confession and baptism rituals can save you, that an ex opera operato ritual performed by a pedophile priest can save you, you're a curse of God. A social gospel, like a Rick Warren's peace plan, if you believe that's the way to salvation, you're a curse of God. There's only one way of salvation. God becomes a man in the person of the Messiah to take our sin. The judgment for our sin comes on him, and he raises from the dead to give us eternal life. That through faith and repentance in him, we'll be born again, we'll be justified by faith, saved completely by grace. That's the gospel. That's the only gospel. Somebody believes a different gospel. They're not biblically Christian. They were cursed of God. Now what Paul says here is, the people who will do this stuff, it's not really a different gospel. He says, I'm amazed you're quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not really another one. Only some are disturbing you. There's two terms people should know and one that is often misused. Now I'm going to define these terms purely in the theological sense. Legalism Nomianism A hard legalism, a hard legalism says we are saved by works. You are saved by keeping the law. That's legalism. You're saved by works. <coughs> now the New Testament tells us by works of the law, no man shall be saved. 
Abraham, the first Jew, believed God before the law was given, we're told. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He was justified by faith. Right from the beginning, Jews were not to be saved by the law, not even from the time of Abraham and the patriarchs. Legalism says you're saved by the law. Nomianism says one of two things. We're saved by grace and law. <laughs> It's not either one, it's both. You're saved by grace and law in nomianism. Or you're saved by grace, but you are sanctified by the law. In other words, well, you can be saved, but if you're not keeping the law, you're not really living the kind of life God wants you to live as a believer. You're not being fully sanctified, made holy, walking in the power of his statutes unless you are keeping the law. Okay? I don't think many people who would believe that Jesus is the Messiah and who are born again, well, obviously, they wouldn't be real legalists. They wouldn't be real legalists. But there's an extreme access of the messianic movement who are definitely nomianists. This did not begin with the messianic movement. It goes back to Galatia. It is literally the oldest trick in the book. Trying to get God's people to live under two covenants. I go back about a decade, maybe a little more, to Waco, Texas. They should have renamed Christendom Town Waco, Texas. You had a cult leader, David Korash, that was not his real name. That was not his real name. And he had a cult that shot it out with the FBI. I couldn't understand what happened or why and I was in upstate New York, up by the Canadian border, in, in the winter time, out in the middle of nowhere. And this pastor gave me 129 pages of testimony he printed off from the internet about David Korash and this cult based on the testimony of people who were in it and left it. This man was out of his mind. This man was completely demon-possessed. But his capacity to control people, to believe and to do things that are just unimaginable, was almost beyond belief. I tried to work out what kind of people would follow him. And he was nuts. He would make these rules and he would change the rules every week. Every day there was a Bible study that lasted exactly 13 hours to the minute. Always 13 hours, <laughs> not 12 hours and 59 minutes, <laughs> not 13 hours and one, 13 hours to the minute. It was always from the book of Revelation. And he indoctrinated these people to think, this is what he did, that he was this angelic being who was semi divine, one of the angels in the book of Revelation. That when the apocalypse comes, their salvation will depend <laughs> on their being with him and under his protection. <clears throat> and every day, for 13 hours a day, he did this. But of course, because he was superhuman, he was angelic. Now right away, we know from Jude and from other sources that when the angels left their rightful abode, in other words, when they had sexual relations with human beings, it was, 
it was the Nephilim, it was something the satanic. Okay. And of course, we know that'll happen again eschatologically in some way. You were going to have demonic incarnations before Christ returns. But by virtue of the fact he said that's who he was, even if it was who he was, which obviously he wasn't, it would be demonic for him to have relations with humans, sexual relations with humans. <laughs> but that didn't matter. Because he had this angelic sperm, only he could procreate. So the first thing he had to do was to say he was the only truly spiritual man. And he had a boudoir up on top of the compound, and the guy would not only take people's wives, he would say that they couldn't sleep with them because they weren't worthy because their semen was not angelic. And he would take little girls, some of them his daughters, and use them as sex objects. This man was completely sick. He was totally deranged. He was absolutely nuts. And he didn't want anybody to look to anybody but him as a spiritual authority. And I'm reading page after page. So he would take an attractive woman, and then remember these guys couldn't sleep with their wives. And during the Bible study, he would stop, and he would look at somebody like he could read their mind, and he would accuse them of lust. And he'd, he'd, he'd get an attractive woman and make her stand up and strip and do obscene things, and then he'd go, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> and he would try to humiliate these guys in the presence of their wives and children, so they would only look to him as the spiritual man. Then he would beat women with paddles in front of their children. You'd be beating them mercilessly, and they'd be saying, you see what happens to mommy when she's a bad girl? And he'd be doing all the six, so the children wouldn't look to their mother, they'd only look, he'd be the only parent. The only father figure, the only mother figure even. The guy was totally, totally nuts. And I'm wondering, what kind of people would do this, would follow this guy, would place themselves in submission to his crazy whims, and he had these rules he changed every week. And if somebody broke one, he'd scream and beat them. And the pedophile, the sadist, a nut. And I'm reading and reading, and I'm trying to figure out who would listen to this guy. About 40% of his followers were from England. 40% were from England. 60% from other countries, mainly the United States and Canada. 40% were from here. And about a third of his followers were black people. Smaller amounts of Asians and Hispanics, the rest were white. Some English, some American. Some male, some female. But I couldn't get a profile. Who is he attract? Is he attracting ethnic minorities? Is he attracting... Who? who, who who's he... There was no profile. It appealed to crazy Americans, to crazy English people. There was no profile. There was nothing in common of all these people. He had different ones from different countries, different ethnic backgrounds. And I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. What the, then I get to it. Every one of his followers, every single one, was a Seventh-day Adventist. Trying to live under two covenants. Trying to live under two covenants. The oldest trick in the book. I have warned before. Once you fall into one major error. Once somebody goes into one major error. They automatically predispose themselves for something worse. That's like I said. The people who follow the Toronto deception. Will believe anything. If people will swallow that. These people will believe anything anything. Once you go into one major error, you automatically predispose yourself to believing something worse. This, again, is the oldest trick in the book. Trying to get God's people to live under two covenants. Now understand, we've pointed this out a number of times, the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law. We rejected God's authority and, and rejected his love and rebelled against his authority under the influence of Satan. God would raise up the Jewish people, 
that through this nation he would give his word and send his Messiah to reconcile man back to himself. So the Jews become a microcosm of humanity. They are a microcosm of the human condition. There was only one religion God ever ordained. That was Old Testament Judaism. Mosaic Judaism. The gospel is not religion. The Torah is God's law. But through the Torah, God would demonstrate from the example of the Jews, the fallen nature of man. He would demonstrate through Israel and the Jews our inability to keep his law. You can't keep his law. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. The biggest section of the law was a system of blood atonement <laughs> to atone for the fact that you couldn't keep the rest of it. Now what the Pharisees did was they began to appeal to the letter of the law instead of the spirit. Thou shalt not murder. Well, I only beat his head in. I didn't kill him. Jesus said, if you hate somebody unjustly, you murder them. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, I didn't actually sleep with her. We just went out a few times. But it's not your wife. Uh, if you lust after someone's wife or someone's husband, as far as God's concerned, you committed adultery. Jesus always appealed to the spirit of the law. He interpreted the letter in light of the spirit. The Pharisees played legalistic games with the letter in order to try to keep it. <laughs> but they couldn't keep it. They couldn't keep it. The law was given to show that we have a fallen nature. It was given to demonstrate through the example of Israel and the Jews that we could not keep his law and that we need a Messiah. These animals that made blood atonement, the sheep, um, the lamb, the ox, the goat, they're pictures of Yeshua, of Jesus. That was the purpose of the law. It was our pedion, it says in Galatians, our teacher to point us to Christ. The law shows through the example of Israel and the Jews that man has fallen and can't keep the law and points us to the Messiah, the one person who did keep it perfectly. Okay? That's the purpose. The law is the shadow. The hand is the Messiah. Always remember this. The closer the hand gets to the screen, the better the definition of the shadow. The shadow can teach you about the hand, but that's all. Only the hand can show you what the hand is. The law can teach people about God. From the law of Moses, you can know about God. But only with Jesus can you know God. You understand? The law can teach you about God. You can know about God from the law. Jesus reveals God. Here's the shadow. It's teaching us about the hand. Once the hand comes, does the shadow have any further purpose? No. No. Well, it teaches about God. So what does the law mean for us now? How do we use it? Well, one person who teaches this quite accurately is a guy called Ray Comfort, a Jewish guy from New Zealand. He has a hell's best kept secret. We still use the law. It says the law is good if one uses it rightly. You need to use the law of Moses in witnessing to Jewish people. Look, you can't keep it. You've got no high priest. The temple had to be destroyed after the Messiah came. You can't even keep the law. You use the shadow to teach a Jew about the hand. But the law is based on the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. How many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? <laughs> Everybody's a liar. Everybody's a murderer. We use the, ten, we use the, the, 
the law, in that sense, of the, of the commandments, the Ten Commandments, to witness to unsaved people. To show them their need for salvation. We use the shadow to teach them about their need for the hand. That's what we do. That is the first reason, purpose of the law for a believer. Evangelism. Evangelism. Don't preach grace until you preach law. That's the first reason. Let's look at the second reason. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 19, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew. Notice he was no longer an observant Jew, but he became as one. That I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, the Torah, as under the law, though not being under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, etc., Second reason, acculturation, testimony. It wasn't only Britain who did it, but let's talk about Britain. Britain used, misused, the Great Commission. Make disciples of all nations. It misused the Great Commission not to make disciples of Jesus, but subjects of the King. <laughs> they tried to turn Asians, Africans, and others into British people through the use of religion. Okay? Jesus never said to turn somebody into an Englishman. <laughs> he said to turn them into a follower of Jesus. Okay. However, there was another Englishman named Hudson Taylor, founder of China and the Mission. Hudson Taylor dressed like a Chinese person. He ate rice with chopsticks. He wore slippers like a Chinese person. He lived like a Chinese person. He learned to speak Chinese. Hudson Taylor married a Chinese girl. Hudson Taylor became culturally Chinese even though he was an Englishman. He became as Chinese. He never had eyes like this. He still looked like an English person. But he culturally lived as a Chinese person for the sake of his testimony to them in order to reach them with the gospel within the context of their own culture. Hudson Taylor was right. Okay, the Church of England was wrong. Hudson Taylor was right. He was brethren. And Hudson Taylor always paid his tithe to Jewish evangelism. He said to the Jew first, he believed that. He said the contribution every year from China back to England to evangelize Jews. So we have a cooperation. That is the second reason. Third reason. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians 7. Verse 17. 
only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this matter let him walk. And thus I direct in all the churches. Was any man called already circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is keeping the commandments of God. Now circumcision preceded the law of Moses. It was not part of the law of Moses. It was patriarchal, it was not Mosaic. Jewish believers circumcised their children. To a Jew, getting circumcised does not mean going under the law. It means you're a Jew. Okay. But in Galatians, Paul says, those who are trying to persuade Gentiles to become circumcised, I wish that they would castrate themselves. <laughs> he actually uses that, that's the term. That they would emasculate themselves. To a Jew, it had to do with identity. To a non-Jew, it meant coming under the law. Now you're becoming a follower of Judaism. There is no problem with Jewish believers having their children circumcised because Paul circumcised Timothy. His mother was a Jew. There's no problem with this. But for non-Jews to do it, Paul says, don't do it. Do not seek to become part of this religion. Judaism, in its present form, is just as false as any other false religion. Roman Catholicism is a complete corruption of biblical Christianity. Talmudic Judaism is a complete corruption of biblical Judaism, of the Torah. The way the church fathers, the popes, later on, even Protestants, corrupted the gospel into something alien to the Bible. They corrupted Christianity and turned it into Christendom. The rabbis did the same thing. They made broken cisterns. Talmudic Judaism is a corruption of the Old Testament, the same as Roman Catholicism or liberal Protestantism or the Greek Orthodox Church or corruptions of the New. They're false. And we're told, don't seek to give up your own identity. Don't seek to do it. Now, if you were a missionary in a particular country, like Hudson Taylor, and you were doing what Paul did, and for the sake of your testimony to those people, you took on their culture, that is one thing. But when you do it in a legalistic way, when you seek to convert to Judaism or to any other religion, he says, don't do it. It is to do with temporal identity. We are told that the followers of Jesus will come from every nation, tribe, and tongue. <laughs> if he wanted them all to be Jews, he would have <laughs> made them all Jews. If he wanted them all to be Filipinos, he would have made them all Filipinos. Look out the window. <clears throat> Just from here, I can see no less than perhaps a half dozen, probably closer to a dozen different types of plants and flora. Just looking out that window. God did not want all sycamore trees. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made oak trees. And he wouldn't have made pine trees. And he wouldn't have made maple trees and cherry trees if he only liked sycamore trees. Now, sycamore trees are nice. I like sycamore trees. But I also like oak trees. I also like cherry trees and apple trees and pear trees. He's a god of variety. He wants followers from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Look around this room. It was Chairman Mao who tried to make everybody dress the same and speak the same. Everybody in this room looks different. Every fingerprint is different. Every eye signature is different. 
He does not like clones. He wants us to be conformed to the image and likeness of him, not to any human agency. Those are the three reasons. Now there is one proviso. Let's go back to chapter 9. Verse 21, to those without law, a nomos. Law is nomos, a nomos. For those without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. I've explained this before. Say you're going to drive to France through the Channel Tunnel. So you go down to Kent and you drive your automobile onto the train that takes you to the north of France. In Britain, you drive on the left. On the continent, you drive on the right. Actually, Ireland tried to come in line with Europe and they wanted to change from the left to the right, but they decided to do it gradually to avoid confusion. <laughs> I can tell those jokes. My mother's family is from Donegal. You can't say once you go through the tunnel and now you're in France, you can do anything you want, you're not under the law anymore. No. You're not under British law. <laughs> you're under French law. When somebody's born again, they're no longer under the law of sin and death. They're under the law of Christ. There are do's and don'ts in the New Testament, the same as there are in the Old. Now again, if you've got to do this, you've got to do it right. I apologize to those who know it. Let's look at the balloons. We're going to look at some nice balloons. This is a balloon. This is a balloon. This is a balloon. Three balloons. This balloon is a vacuum. There's nothing in it. And the law of gravity says because there's nothing in this balloon, gravity and atmospheric pressure are going to force it down. Okay? However, if we exhale into a balloon, we put carbon dioxide into it. The problem with carbon dioxide is it's still heavier than the air in our atmosphere. And it will still go down. It will only make it go down slower. But if I put helium into the balloon, something happens. A stronger law than the law of gravity takes over. This is called the law of buoyancy in physics. And the law of buoyancy says now It won't go down because of gravity. 
a stronger law has taken over. Fallen man will always fall. Religion is futile. You can try to keep the balloon up with CO2, but it's still going to go down. <laughs> On the other hand, you can try to keep the balloon down with helium, but it's still going to go up. Religious people will try and strive to keep the law, but it's sooner or later they're going to sin. They're going to go back to their old base nature. On the other hand, a Christian, the just man falls seven times a day but quickly gets up again. <laughs> Religion can keep you up for a minute. But they'll just go back down. Terrible atrocities are committed in the name of religion, including Judaism and Christendom. Think of the helium as representing the Holy Spirit. It empowers the balloon to overcome the law. The law of buoyancy is stronger than the law of gravity. The law of grace is stronger than the law of Moses. You understand? This is the law of Christ. When you're born again, you get the Holy Spirit. You don't have to strive to keep it up. You just have to abide in Him. Walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. <laughs> now, a down gust can push a helium-filled balloon down, but because the helium's in it, it's going to go up again. A Christian may fail. They may drop their cross at a time of weakness. But they're going to get up again. <laughs> That poor guy with the CO2, he might keep it up for a few minutes. He can strive. But ultimately, it's not going to work. This is being irreligious. This is being religious. This is being saved. You understand? This is being irreligious. This is being religious. This is being saved. Does anybody not understand? Now let's go back to this enomos. To those without the law, though not being without the law of Christ... Be careful of people who are given to something called licentiousness. I can never spell the thing. There are do's and don'ts in the Bible in both Testaments. The New Testament tells us, and I've pointed this out a number of times, and I only take it because it's a popular example, the fruit of the Spirit is ikrete, self-control. If somebody is not in control of themselves, God's not in control. If an alcoholic gets saved, and they go out to a pub and begin drinking heavily, or begin drinking at all, an alcoholic shouldn't drink at all, if they get saved, are they in control of themselves? No, because God is not in control of them. We saw these deceivers and liars with the laughing drunken things some years ago on the floor going nuts and all this. And we said, well, this is not biblical. Oh, you're a legalist! You're a legalist! No. You're a legalist. You're a Pharisee. No, you're a Pharisee. Where is this in the Bible? I can show you where the Bible says don't do it. <laughs> where can you say the Bible says to do it? 
They had to twist things out of context, but the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, not the lack of it. They were saying the opposite. Um, and they respond, you're a Pharisee. No, you're a Pharisee. You're just too ignorant to know it. Your pastor's too ignorant to know it. You're the one who's teaching as precepts of God the inventions of men. <laughs> Where's your biblical basis for this? What they are is anything goes. A nomos, anti nomian. Now, they have no idea what they're really doing. They're doing something very dangerous by saying that they have no law. We're under the law of Christ. The Antichrist is the Anthropon a nomon. He is the man of lawlessness. These movements like Elam and things like this are setting people up for the Antichrist. These are Antichrist systems. They're setting people up for the Anthropon a nomon. Yes, we're under the law. We are under the law of Christ. Let each one remain in the state he was called. Last night I spoke at a messianic fellowship in London. Unsaved Jews go there to hear the gospel. People bring them there to hear the gospel. Did Kedush Shabbat. It's important for Jews to see that Jews who believe in Jesus don't stop being Jewish. <laughs> that they keep their culture. As a matter of fact, most Jews who believe in Jesus become more observant than they were before they were saved. But putting one of these on your head does not make somebody any more Jewish or any less Jewish. And it certainly doesn't make someone any more Christian or any less Christian. It is purely cultural. That's all. When you make it into something more than that, you got a big problem. In conclusion, turn with me please to Romans chapter 14. Verse 4, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and stand he will. For the Lord is able to make him stand. One man regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. He who eats does so for the Lord. He who gives thanks to God, for he who does not eat for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. We are told, do not judge other people for what days they observe. There's a website of some maniac in Aylesbury that attacks me, not because I celebrate Christmas, I don't but because I refuse to condemn people who do. <laughs> and he says on his website, the Lord gave him a dream that I was in a medical surgery with Benny Hinn pulling my hair out and yelling. This confirms I'm a false prophet. <laughs> That's the compliment. I think he ought to check into a psychiatric surgery and have a lobotomy. <laughs> We're told directly not to condemn people. Let them be convinced in their own mind. Now my family, we have the nativity. We don't have Christmas. This time of year, Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. That's what my family observed. But my family are Israeli. We 
we have the nativity, but not Father Christmas, not Christmas trees or these things. Nonetheless, let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Verse 16, Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a new moon, a festival, or a Sabbath. These things are a shadow of what is to come. They are a shadow. What's the shadow do? Teaches about the hand. The hand is the substance. Once the hand comes, of what consequence is the shadow? Be careful of people who are Sabbatarian legalists. We should worship on a Saturday, not a Sunday. This is crazy. Let no one act as your judge in regard to such things. They're only a shadow. Now that the substance has come, it's only a shadow. It's fulfilled in Christ. I don't care if somebody worships on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Tuesday or every day. My family generally keeps both. But if you want to do it Sunday, that's okay with me. But why would you abandon your own culture for somebody else's culture? Unless you're a missionary to that culture. (laughs) There were only four things Gentiles had to do. We've explained the binding and loosing before. I'm terrible with keeping these things organized. Luo Deo. Luo Deo. Hebrew. Hitir. Asur. Acts 15, to the Holy Spirit and to us, that we do not trouble the Gentiles. There's only four things that were a sort to them. These are juridical terms. They all. Keep away from idolatry. Keep away from immorality. Keep away from the ritual consumption of blood. Consumption of blood. In other words, the Roman Catholic Eucharist. And keep away from strangulation. Cruelty to animals, but that had a pagan connotation. Okay? Avoid those things. Those things you are bound to keep. And they're based more on the Noahide law than the Mosaic. But you're free from the rest. You don't need a mezuzah on your door. (laughs) You can eat shrimp if you want to. No problem. If you do, you do. If you don't, you don't. But not eating it does not make you any more holy than wearing a keeper. <laughs> and eating it does not make you any less. These things are a shadow. You've got the substance. Be careful of the extreme access of the messianic movement. There is no such thing as a messianic movement. It's multiple movements. There are good strains and there are bad strains. You've got people who are quite solid, who teach the word of God quite accurately. People like Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Michael Rydelnik, Model Ballister. There are good strains of the messianic movement. 
but you've got lunatics. You have neo-Galatians. You have people who are trying to put people, even Gentiles, into bondage to the law. You have conferences where they're lifting up Jewishness instead of Jesusness. Now there is one last thing that is important. One last thing that is important concerning the law. And our next teaching will we'll show you it. Look at 1 Corinthians again. Verse 6, your boasting is not good. You not know a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Clean out the old leaven. You may be a new lump just as you are unleavened. For the Messiah, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Okay. Notice what the apostles do. They again use the shadow to teach about the substance. There is milk and there is meat. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews, written to Jewish believers. Verse 13. Well, let's begin in verse 11. So, Hebrews chapter 5. Being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning him we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk, not meat. Everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He's a babe. But solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good from evil. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1 says the same thing. There is milk and there is meat. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. You are not able to receive it. In other words... If you only understand the New Testament on its own, you are eating baby food. You are having a diet of milk. A newborn baby needs a continuous diet of milk, that's all. It is incapable of digesting solid food. It would be dangerous for them. But at some point, the baby has to be weaned. Unless you understand the 30% of the, New, of the Bible we call the New Testament, in light of the 70%, the Old, you have a steady diet of milk. He says, milk only. Not a problem with milk, but milk only. To have a biblically balanced diet, you need the 70%, which is the Old Testament, plus the 30%, which is the New. When you have people who only are taught the New Testament, and they're not taught how the New fulfills the Old, they are eating baby food. What does Paul do in 1 Corinthians? He uses the Passover, doesn't he? He uses the Feast of Unleavened Bread to teach about sin. Christ, our Passover, has been slain. He uses the symbolism of the Passover to teach about the atonement. Now you can know Jesus died for your sin without knowing about the Passover. But you're never going to understand it in depth unless you understand that he is the Passover. You can take the Lord's Supper and not know anything about the Passover Seder. But you're never going to properly understand the Lord's Supper unless you understand the Seder. You must not practice Jewish rituals, but you must understand them theologically. You understand? We are to understand. You don't have to keep the Jewish holidays, but you have to understand how Jesus fulfilled them. If you don't understand Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, 
you're not going to properly understand the atonement of Christ. If you don't understand the Passover, you're not going to properly understand salvation. If you don't understand the, 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 the Last Supper as a Seder, you're not going to understand the Lord's Supper. If you don't understand the typology of leaven, you're not going to understand um, the Bible's teaching on sin. If you don't understand Old Testament literary symbolism, you're not going to be able to understand the book of Revelation. You'll have milk, not meat. No, you don't have to keep the law, but you have to understand it doctrinally and theologically. You understand? There's a big difference. There's a big difference. It's a big difference. A medical doctor is not a biochemist, but he has to understand biochemistry. Otherwise, he can't understand physiology or pharmacology. A dentist doesn't have to be a biochemist, but he has to understand biochemistry, or he can't be a dentist. You don't have to be an observant Jew, but you have to understand Old Testament Judaism. Otherwise, you can't be a mature Christian. That's what Paul teaches, that's what Hebrews teaches. But what does he say to these people? He says, You foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? When you see people trying to put you under bondage to the law, particularly as a Gentile, it is witchcraft. The word in Greek is mesmero. They put the evil eye on you. That's what it means, to put the evil eye on somebody in order to control them. What did Koresh do in Waco, Texas? He'd stare at them. He put the evil eye on them. It's demonic. It's madness. It's the oldest trick in the book. It is nothing short of witchcraft than to try to force people to live under two covenants. You are either under one or the other. You're either under law or grace. You're either saved or you need to get saved. That's it. You can't be a little bit pregnant. You either are or you're not. (laughs) Neither can you be a little bit saved. You either are or you're not. You can't be a little bit under one covenant and a little bit under... No, no. You are either under one or under the other. Yes, the shadow still has its purpose. It has its purpose for evangelism. It has its purpose as a teaching tool. It has its purpose culturally. But it has no power of salvation. And it has no power of sanctification. In and of itself, it will not make somebody a better believer. It simply won't. Now, if somebody wishes to do it unto the Lord, because that's their culture, they do it unto the Lord, for them it could be. All things are lawful, not all things are helpful. It is perfectly lawful for me to eat shrimp. But I'm an evangelist to Jews, and it's not helpful to my testimony, so I don't do it. I just won't do it. But I'm not going to criticize you. Shrimp is delicious. Bon appetit. Bete avon. God created these things to be enjoyed. Go eat the shrimp. (laughs) Nothing wrong with it. Perfectly lawful. Just in my case, it's not helpful. Okay? If I lived in Holy Catholic Ireland where alcohol is such a problem, in England I could go into a pub for lunch. In Ireland... I don't want to go into that pub. I'll tell you why. It's lawful. But in a Celtic culture where you have so much alcohol abuse, it's not helpful. Anything not done in faith is sin. In England, I have the faith to go into a pub. In Ireland, I don't. (laughs) I'd have no problem eating shrimp if I was not an evangelist to Jews. But I don't have the faith to do it. Not because it's wrong, 
because it's not helpful to my testimony. It's a matter of personal choice and conscience. Do not let anybody bewitch you. And I'm told here in Nottingham that there are some Christians who are being bewitched. Make no mistake about it. God calls it witchcraft. Have nothing to do with that kind of hyper-messianic legalism. It is not biblical Judaism. It is not biblically messianic Judaism. It is witchcraft. Let's have a break. Bima.